Well, good afternoon, and it's it's a pleasure to see you all again this year. Uh, been for the last few IGUSes, and have really enjoyed really enjoyed the community here. What an auspicious date, 10, 10, 2010. Hopefully, hopefully it'll be good. Uh, so we've been doing a lot of GWAS studies over the years. I've talked in previous years about copy number studies. We've also done a lot of SNP studies. And as we've been observing the, the sequencing technologies coming out, we've been looking, thinking, you know, how can we bridge all of this microarray work with, with the next-gen sequencing? And so the idea that uh, when I wrote this abstract that we were working on was to impute dense genotype calls from the 1,000 genomes data, hopefully to find more associations. Um, the work really kind of shows that there's only so much we can really do with this data. Um, but uh, in particular, I'm going to go through an Alzheimer's studies and show sort of a dramatic failure uh, to, to try to use 1,000 genomes data imputation to find an association. And uh, hopefully suggest some alternative approaches where I think we might uh, find some some uh, marrying between the technologies, at least until sequencing completely replaces microwaves in whether it's five years or or sooner, you get different predictions. So this study is posted on on dbGaP recently. It's a study that uh, GlaxoSmithKline sponsored with nine or ten centers in Canada. Uh, about 1,577 samples, about half cases, half controls, Alzheimer's. They also looked at age of onset. So one of those rare studies we looked at where they randomized the cases and controls on plates properly, one of the 5% that has, uh, that, that we've looked at. I'm sure there's all your studies are great. Um, <laughs> and, and so uh, it was a 500 case study, and they must have had you know, some clinical trial statisticians who were really careful to randomize it. Um, and uh, interesting, the APOE, there's two APOE SNPs uh, 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 that they included in the study through low throughput genotyping methods that are not on the 500K array. There's actually no variance in the 500K array. And so we called the genotypes with, eight, with uh, C realm as a, a feeder into Beagle call, uh, which, by the way, be whole nother talk is Beagle call really does a nice job at alleviating batch effects, not completely. Experimental design is the way to do that, but there were no uh, spurious associations. In fact, if you do no filtering on, on the SNPs whatsoever, this is your Manhattan plot. So the power design of experiments. The two peaks you see um, over here in, in orange in chromosome 19 are the two APOE SNPs that are not on the array. One here at 10 on minus 60th and another roughly at 10 to the minus 6th, and as you zoom in, you can see that 10 to the minus 6th uh, data point faintly. So the question was, if we didn't have genotyped those two SNPs uh, through low put means, could we have taken 1,000 genomes data and imputed those APOE SNPs and found the significant association, or at least you know found some compelling evidence there? And so. Uh, as I said, we used CRL and Beagle call, and then we did three different runs uh, on chromosome 19, the 1,000 genome CEPH, 60 parental individuals, uh, uh, imputing those with the AFI 500K, doing that a second time where we included the APOE SNPs. So obviously we have the answer in there, but we want to see how it fills out the nearby region. And then we also looked at, at uh, all three CEPH populations, there were 180 individuals, uh, the parental data from Yoruban and, and Chinese and Japanese populations as well as CEPH. So at the bottom plot, you see the, the 500K without the APOE SNPs. Um, <clears throat> APOE associations actually not near this peak, that's sort of 10 to the minus, between 10 to the minus third and fourth, it's actually somewhere in between here. So it, it, you know, the SNP's not assayed, obviously. You, you, you don't see any appreciable um, increase in significance uh, with imputing the CEPH population, using the CEPH 1000 genomes population. Uh, this region here is just a little boost of this region. Again, not in the APOE. In, and if you include APOE, of course, you have the signal, and then you have the nearby SNPs that are in LD with it and you get this nice broad peak of all the SNPs that are in LD with APOE. Now, interestingly, 
the LD patterns are really quite different between the, the top LD plot includes APOE SNPs and the middle one doesn't. And you see, uh, you know, it's not just the APOE region, which is, excuse me, is right uh, here. So these all line up. This is your 10 to the minus 60th p value. And uh, the, there's regions out here that are not correlated uh, without APOE, but then become correlated. And, and the whole structure of the LD, you know, 80 kilobases away actually can change when you impute, when you, when you include two SNPs in the imputation. So, um, interesting thing we also tried was, let's take the APOE SNP, which is RS429358, and set that as our um, dependent variable and run an association test with the rest of the genome. And you do see a 10 to the minus, uh, I think it's 10 to the minus 13th p-value over in uh, chromosome 19 here, somewhere near APOE. It's actually about 83 kilobases away, genome-wide significant. Now, when you look at that SNP, uh, the, the significance 1.4 times 10 to the minus 13th is how significant when you do a, it actually was a 3 by 3 table, F-test comparing a additive model 0, 1, 2 versus the three genotypes. Um, and, but the LDR squared was only 0.036 and the D-prime very low 0.25. Now when you actually look at RS429358 incorrectly imputed, it just imputes the monomorphic um, uh, major allele TT for, for all of the samples. Despite it appearing in 15% of the Ceph, as well as 15% in the overall population. So actually a rather common uh, variant, and yet um, when we talk about the failure of imputation in the case of rare, uh, rare uh, uh, alleles, and yet this is actually quite common. Uh, it appears to be, it's just in low LD with any other uh, uh, SNP on the 500K. Um, and as I showed earlier, we, if we do include it, we get this broad peak of associations. So what are the implications? I mean, it's perhaps no surprise we can't impute a SNP that's not correlated with any of our study SNPs. Um, but usually we hear, you know, it's the rarer SNPs that are the problem. And so if we think about all this discussion of rare variants, uh, where it gets even worse in terms of if we're going to find something with a 1% minor allele frequency and then try to do impu imputation uh, in our original GWASs that we run on you know, AFI 500K, AFI 60, Lumina, you know, one, one million arrays and, and omni quads and so forth, um, it's, it's, we're going to ev be even more likely to have a problem doing this type of imputation um, to, to call these rare, uh, uh, rare variants. Um, so we're gonna, they're going to have, actually, you know, it's going to have limited utility. Uh, and the next generation of microarrays that are coming out might fare better because they're looking at this rarer content. But I really question why we expect rare variants in healthy people to be correlated with disease phenotypes. In other words, we're still using these, these HapMap samples. Yes, we're augmenting it with some other, presumably, we actually don't even know the phenotypes, but you know they're average individuals with the average degree of illness with perhaps a few outliers. So, so as I think about how we're going to go forward and, and, and you know, find the missing heritability. At least one slice of the picture is my thinking on this is obviously we get the most power to detect associations when the frequency of the variant matches the frequency of the disease. And the variants in HapMap, 1,000 genomes, don't satisfy this criteria except for the most common diseases. However, the problem I have with sort of the, you know, Common disease, common variant is in the word common when we describe disease. That is, a rare disease is, is typically um, classified as, as less frequent than one in 2,000. But the populations we're drawing our, our SNPs from are much smaller than, than 2,000 individuals. It's been, you know, 180 for the longest time or, and even less in the early phases. So diseases like type 1 diabetes, it is a common disease by the, by the definition of less than 1 in 2,000. It's actually about 1 in 500 to 800. I mean, you, you look up these estimates. That's the ones I got. Um, maybe someone knows 
differently, but they're about, it's about that. And then when we further look at subphenotypes, um, you know, there's diseases like bipolar that are around one in a hundred. Um, Barrett Kerner and I did some work uh, in the last year or so, mostly was Barrett figuring out subphenotypes of bipolar dis disorder that she could find associations with. So if we got a 100, one in a hundred disease, but maybe five major subphenotypes, now we're talking, you know, some subphenotypes one in 500, some one in a thousand. And so um, the success stories we're seeing in next gen sequencing, finding these causative variants, of course, a lot of them is Mendelian. It's, it's you know, really rare diseases. But I think our, our concept of, of, you know, common disease, it's very easy that we could have missed uh, very large odd signals just because we've been sequenced using the sequence of, of healthy individuals. Um, so how can we bridge the gap is what are some ways forward? One approach is it's still the case and will be for some time. I think the, the, the ratio is like one to 200 when you look at costs of, of running a, a targeted sequence, uh, I mean a targeted microarray compared to uh, a whole genome uh, sequencing at high coverage. Um, so I'd recommend we sequence moderate numbers of cases for a disease to detect variants and there's people who are uh, much better at thinking of power calculations than me about what that what moderate ought to be. Um, families are ideal for error identification and reducing the search space and a lot of the success stories in, in uh, the next gen sequencing are families. And I would say, you know, the ultimate subphenotype is familial disease, right? So we're going to be using, you know, the thousand genomes and other control populations will be very useful, I think, as filters to, to you know, reduce search space. But I think the idea is we want, when we think rare variant, it's with respect to what population? Rare with respect to the population as a whole, but we need to look at variants that are common with respect to uh, with respect to cases, um, so I, I, what I see is one way going forward: build custom microarray with the variants that, that you find that are common in cases and rare in controls. Uh, run these in larger studies, um, replicate them, uh, depending on on whether you're finding a lot of such variants or one or two. It depends. You might be just doing you know low low throughput targeted sequencing or using a microarray. And I'd say if we're going to build a universal microarray, let's you know let's pick uh, the diseases everybody cares about that we've seen all these GWAS studies on for the last few years. Run run a set of samples for each of those, uh, and uh, and I think pooling is actually going to be be a very interesting uh, an approach uh, to also improve on costs and so forth. And then you know as a follow up to Suzanne's talk, I mean this this all sort of goes out the window if We've got many deleterious mutations, say in a gene or or in a pathway, where the disease is, is still, shall we say, cognitively more simple than, oh, there's 70,000 associations all over the gene, genome of 1.01 odds, but rather, okay, it's a, it's a handful of, of genes that, that define a pathway, but there's all sorts of variation in each gene and in promoter regions and so forth. In that case, uh, collapsing methods and, 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 and you know, the whole survey that, that of methods and whatever other ones we can think of next, in combination with sequencing is, is most likely to be the way to go. But to the extent that, that we can sort of line up on a particular SNP in the genome and that, that yes, there's a common ancestor that that this is filtered through the population and, 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 and there's a good representation of that specific deleterious SNP or, or indel or what have you, uh, I think that, that there's a really good um, place for, for um, custom microarrays uh, combining with, with, um, with the uh, next gen sequencing and, and the next gen after that. So thank you so much and I'll welcome any questions.